Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ita. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, this is our first time for this course, so uh, thank you for joining us. This is a really nice afternoon to be writing, so uh, I know that's what I'd be doing if I wasn't teaching this today. Um, as, uh, as he mentioned, we've got Alan, Jim, and Ian uh, with us, uh, and Chris, uh, who are volunteers uh, at Common Cycle. Uh, we're located just uh, around the corner, a couple blocks away, at... Um, 416? 416 West um, <clears throat> Now, uh, we do have a few uh, printed handouts, but we also have QR codes for the presentation handouts. And um, the uh, presentation today is also being uh, posted on the AADL website. OK. Um, so <clears throat> as a real quick overview, um, Rough structure of the course, it's about three hours. We're hoping to actually run less than that. But the idea is it'll be about 90 minutes uh, worth of uh, discussion or this lecture, and then we'll have about 90 minutes worth of hands-on. Um, again, we've not run this before, so we're hoping to get that first part down to maybe 60 minutes. It's intended for, for teens or adults. And um, this is a very compressed, very abbreviated version of our six-week course. So twice a year, we have a course that gets into nuts and bolts, ball bearings, et cetera. Um, but uh, I think most people don't need that or aren't able to do that commitment. We also uh, typically have 18 to 20 people in that class, and it's usually oversubscribed. So this, uh, I think, allows us to reach out and provide much more accessible information to the community. Um, and uh, we'll have a information for our website. You can get on our web, our mailing list if you're interested in the more extensive course. And of course, we do have community hours, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Any questions that you might have, uh, feel free to ask them. But uh, some of the questions might better be saved for the hands-on part, because uh, then you can actually see what the, uh, what the answers are. So. Um, one of the first basics about that we wanted to talk about is uh, bike fit. And so you might ask, what is good bike fit? And the, the answer is it depends, because if you're riding a, like a cargo bike, you want to fit very differently than if you're riding a racing bike. And the trade-offs are basically between comfort and efficiency. So on a racing bike, you want to be super efficient, you want to go really fast. So you've got drop bars, so you can be aerodynamic, but for a lot of people, that's not very comfortable. Where more of a cargo city bike, you're gonna have handlebars that give you a much more upright posture. Now, the first thing, though, is, uh, and probably the more, most important part of bike fit, is making sure you have uh, adequate leg extension. So if you see sometimes the little BMX bikes, um, they'll be riding where the knees are coming up real high because the seat's very low. Well, on a BMX bike, you do want the seat low because when you're doing these jumps and all that, you don't want that seat to get in your way. So in that case, that's a very unique situation. On a BMX bike, you do actually want to have the seat super low because when you're doing these, these tricks, that seat will be in your way. But if you're pedaling, you want your leg to get almost full extension. And so you can see here there is just a little bit of bend at the bottom of the stroke. If your leg is fully extended, your knee locks out, that can cause knee pain. Your hips start to rock, which causes chafing. And so if you're going just a couple miles, it may not be an issue, but if you're going to be riding 20, 30 miles, or let's say an hour, uh, you are not going to be happy after that hour. <clears throat> then, um, with regards to the rest of the fit, once you've got the seat position, then the question is, how far should you be forward or backwards? Uh, a lot of people will complain of uh, wrist pain or neck pain or back pain, and usually that's because they're leaning too far forward or they're putting too much pressure on their uh, wrists. So uh, as you can see, there are things like ergonomic bike grips that can help 
But a lot of times what you really want to do is you want to have a more upright posture because that will help take the pressure off your wrists. There are other adjustments that you can do. Um, if you move the seat forward, that has the same effect as moving the handlebars back, which, again, gives you a more upright posture. Um, when you move, as you move the seat forward, though, it does also have slightly the effect of lowering the seat since it brings your hips closer to where you're pedaling. Um, and usually, depending on the type of um, a bike you have, there's usually some degree of adjustment you can do with raising the handlebars. This one can be raised. Um, this one here, you can raise it a certain amount before you have to start purchasing different parts to, to get that adjustment in. But um, there are often ways to take an existing bike that you have and either making the adjustments or purchasing a few parts to make it much more comfortable. I put some BMX bars on a commuter bike like that so I could change my posture. Yeah, yeah so the a BMX bar usually comes up quite a bit more and it has a little cross piece so your hands would, would be up like so. Okay, and um, okay. So the next item is bike safety. So there is a pamphlet that's available by the League of Michigan Bicyclists, and it talks about what every bicycle rider should know. Uh, we do have a couple samples up here if you'd like to look at them later. But you can download the PDF uh, at the website, so we do have some QR codes for that. If you are riding on the sidewalk, um, you can be, in, in Michigan you are allowed to, but it can be quite dangerous. And specifically the reason is, a lot of times cars are not expecting bicyclists to move that quickly. When people are pulling into driveways or pulling out of driveways, they'll look up the sidewalk for a second. But they're thinking about things that are moving at walking speed. You can easily, on a bicycle, you can easily get to 12, 13 miles an hour, which is faster than most people can run. And so at that point, uh, you run the danger of, they kind of see you as they're coming in to pull in their driveway, but they don't realize that by the time they pull in the driveway, you're going to be there too. So once you get past a fast walking pace, it is often safer to be riding actually on the road. And at that point, you do have to follow the rules of the road. You have to assume that drivers can't see you. You should be aware of where the cars are and what they might be doing. Uh, in Michigan, uh, so take, I prefer to take the lane. And what that means is if you ride on the very shoulder, uh, that's not taking lane. If you ride towards the center of the lane, if there are two lanes, that means the other person is going to have to go into the other lane. The way the current Michigan uh, laws are written, it's a, it's a little ambiguous. But I will simply say that it is safer to take the lane because, for example, on Packard Avenue, one time the gentleman passed me and I actually happened to know where he lived, so I was talking to him and I said, you know, I'm legally permitted three feet. I'd, I'd like a little more room next time, please. And he said, I gave you three feet. I'm a cyclist. I, I, I'm very considerate. I said, I, you may think you gave me three feet, but that lane is 10 feet wide. Your F-150 is eight feet wide. Your tires did not cross into the next lane. So that meant that you only had about a foot to my lane, and there, I didn't have a bike lane, which meant that you basically came within you know, a foot and a half of me. So if you take the lane, basically, you're just telling the people, you were, to give me safe passing distance, you're going to have to cross a little bit into the next lane. So please cross more into that lane. Don't just assume that you can squeak by, because that isn't comfortable. So that doesn't mean you can ride right in the middle of the lane, or does it? So the Michigan, the Michigan Driving Code, or um, Michigan, Michigan Motor Vehicle Code, uh, is somewhat ambiguous. It says that you should ride, a bicyclist should ride to the right of the lane as, as long as it's safe, basically. 
I would argue, so depending on your interpretation, that can say that if you don't feel, if there's gravel, obviously, you can ride in the middle. If I would argue that it's safer to ride towards the center. So I would say that the way the Mo Michigan Motor Vehicle Code is written, it does not explicitly say that you are allowed to take the lane. However, I would argue that if, if I, I would argue that if I don't feel safe on the side because people are trying to squeak by, then I should, then I am not, I am not safe because it says if you if if safe to do so. So, <laughs> um, we see bike ninjas at night, you know, dressed all in black. You always want to be visible, day or night. Be visible. Be predictable. And uh, I always ride with a um, mirror on my helmet. Actually, I should have brought this out here. So this allows you to see cars behind you. The mirror uh, is about two inches away from your eye. There are quite a few different versions of this. Uh, products on the on the market. This one's called the Third Eye. This is the one that I like. I've tried several different ones. Uh, it allows you to, instead of having to turn your whole head to check behind your shoulder, basically in your riding position, it, it's just like looking at your rear mirror in a car. You turn your head maybe five, ten degrees and just kind of move your eyes and now you've just checked to see where the cars behind you are. Now, Walk Bike Washtenaw which is a community uh, group focused on improving walkability and biking in Washtenaw. They have a number of bicycle mounted rear view mirrors. So these would be mounted to your handlebars available for free. Uh, and the QR code is here. And, and so if you contact them, uh, they can get you one. I think they, uh, they were offering at one point to uh, actually come out and put on your bike for you. So. Um, that QR code there will help you. And uh, I think it's, it's really important to have a bike bill. I have an air horn here as well, which I'm not going to do. But for, for pedestrians and um, even for, for cars, if you see someone, you know, a lot of times they can still hear you and you can get their attention. Um, obviously, the air horn is uh, if they're really not paying attention. And... Um, and, and trying to pull out into traffic and, and just not be, because they just don't see you. So, okay. Um, let me just go ahead and jump to the next one. Uh, theft prevention. So, how secure is my bike? And the question is, how tempting is your bike? How long are you parking your bike? And there really isn't any way to make your bike completely theft proof, but you really want to have it be the least attractive uh, target. Uh, there's actually a website of somebody in Germany who's figured out how to make their, their nice bicycle look like junk. It involves melted plastic and duct tape and spray paint, and, and it looks like something you wouldn't even want to touch, much less steal. But um, the uh, one, one important thing to know is, you know, cable locks, these things are like 15, 20 bucks. And that's about what they're worth. You can go to Lowe's and you can buy a tool for $10 that will cut this in instantly. So um, these are good for a short, you know, if you're going into Kroger for, for you know, 10 minutes maybe, uh, or, or, or you're in a coffee shop, that might be good for this. They're convenient, but they're not secure. The best cable locks, there are some cable locks that are, that are thicker and more secure. They're almost as good as inexpensive folding locks. So this is, a, uh, this is a folding lock. You're not getting through this with, with a cable cutter. You need a hacksaw or something called a nut splitter. Those are not really easy to, to, to buy or, or find. You, you, can't fit a, you can't fit a hacksaw in your pocket, usually. Uh, and it'll take you several minutes to cut through that. It'll, it'll take you quite a while to cut through that. The best folding locks are about as good as your average U-lock. So now, um, this is less convenient because uh, if 
you can't get your bike right next to the post or whatever it is. You really have to kind of fiddle with it to be able to, to, to lock it. But um, about the only thing that's really going to get through this, they, they make these hydraulic, people take hydraulic jacks and they put little hooks on them. But now you're talking about carrying around this 10 pound jack, bottle jack, or a, uh, a lithium ion angle grinder with a cutoff wheel, which is going to be very loud and attractive a lot of attention, and you're not fitting that in your back pocket either. So, um, you know, the recommendation is to take the appropriate level of security. If you do have to park it somewhere overnight or somewhere where it's going to be for a long time, the strategy I would recommend is buy two of these. And if it's too much to carry, put the U-lock, like, where you lock it up at night, leave it there at the bike rack, and so at night it has two locks on it, but during the day when you're going around, you use something that's more convenient and isn't as secure. Uh, that the U-lock, the, they make fairly inexpensive U-locks, but I mean, they're still about 30 bucks for these. But a U-lock is still going to be much harder to defeat Bolt cutters won't go through this um, unless, unless they're like really, really big bolt cutters. I mean, they're not, I mean, you know, they make, they, make, they have little bolt cutters like this. You need, you're gonna need like a four foot, five foot bolt cutter to try to get through that. Again, it's, um, if, if someone's carrying around a $10, p, you know, cable cutters in their back pocket, you know, they, you have cable cutters here that would work, but these are $40 cable cutters and we don't want to ruin them, but they would easily cut through any of these uh, cable locks. And you can fit them in your back pocket, so that's the thing. Someone can wander around looking for a bike to steal. Um, these bikes also have quick releases. They make security skewers that you can use because sometimes uh, people can steal your front tire. Now you can't ride, or maybe they steal your seat. You can't ride, and they can come back later when no one's there and, and steal the rest of the bike. So that's, that's some of the things that might happen. OK. What's really important, though, is when you do lock your bike, is that you lock the bike and not the wheel. So the two pictures on the left, they've just locked the wheel. And in the top one, it's the rear wheel, which it's kind of hard to get out because there's a chain involved and all that. But on the bottom one, they lock the front wheel, and that wheel even has a quick release. So if I walked up to that bike, I could have the bike without the front wheel in about a second. I would flip that lever, pop it off, and the bike's mine without the front wheel. The two other pictures, those are both e-bikes. The one in the middle, they put a cable, but they looped it around, they looped it around uh, the front wheel, but without securing anything. If you pull that back behind the front wheel, that bike is yours. Okay, I saw, I, actually, I, I took that picture. The other one I found on the internet, that one is another e-bike. They got a U-lock and a cable lock, but what they did was they secured it to the post with the cable. So now you could cut the cable, and if it's an e-bike and it's worth it, you know, you're going to carry it around the corner or somewhere else that you can take it or throw it in the back of the pickup. So you know, the, these are not secure. You always want to try to secure the frame to something solid. If you have quick release wheel, ideally, uh, in my situation, I will, if I can, I will go through both the frame and the wheel and secure that to a post. And so that way, it's very difficult for them to take anything. They could still steal the rear wheel because it's a quick release, but you know, it's going to take a while to get it out of here with the fender and everything and the chain. It's just a lot of work for them to do. It's, it's not something you can do like easily. So. So that's the thing about security, and obviously, uh, nobody wants to get their bike stolen. Okay. All right, next thing we want to talk about is brakes. Um, the front brakes provide most of your stopping power, 
And I've talked to quite a few people who are often uncomfortable using the front brake because they feel like they might pitch over. And what I would recommend is uh, kind of what I do when it snows. The first time it snows of the year, I take the car when I'm driving and I start you know, turning hard, somewhere that's safe, slamming on the brakes, hitting the gas hard, just because I can feel when it starts to slip. I get a feel for what it feels like when I'm hitting the ice. But I'm doing it where I don't have to worry about hitting something. So I would recommend practicing with your front brake, practice braking hard, successively harder so that you start to feel like, okay, I know what that feels like. I didn't, I didn't pitch over the handlebars, so that's okay. Um, because if you really need to stop, you will stop much faster if you lock up the, if you really grab the rear brake, you'll skid, but as soon as you start skidding, that's as much stopping power as it'll provide. The front brake always provides uh, far more stopping power. The other thing though is uh, in adjusting your brakes and knowing whether or not your, your brakes are working properly, you should never be able to bottom these out where these actually touch the handle, the handlebars, et cetera. And there's a barrel adjuster, so in this case, this, it's here. There's, uh, depending on the type of brake, there's often a, there can be a barrel adjuster that's often on the brake itself. But if you turn those out, it effectively shortens the cable and that tightens up your brakes. And so you'll look at that more during the hands-on portion. Uh, the other thing is that the brakes, uh, the brake pads should be uh, perpendicular to the uh, to the rim. So just just to kind of give you an idea, we've got um, brake pads here. Sometimes as they wear, if this is the bottom of the rim, normally you want the brake pad to come in and, and just hit it properly. Uh, if brake pads are not properly adjusted, so if they come in at an angle, they're not contacting it properly, or for example, if, if they were too low, then they would be contacting only part of the, of the rim, and it wouldn't be uh, giving you the right stop, amount of stopping power. And then as the uh, brake pads wear, of course, then you'll want to go back to the uh, barrel adjuster to, uh, again, turn those outwards and that shorten, effectively shortens the cable and, and tightens the brakes, so. Okay, uh, next item then is. So if you have too much play in your brakes, adjust the barrel adjuster? Yes, outwards. yes. Yeah, so what happens is, um, you know, righty tighty, lefty loosey, you're actually loosening the barrel adjuster because by turning the barrel adjuster out, it increases the length of the housing, which comparatively makes the cable shorter than the housing, so it, it tightens up the brakes. So if, if it, to, to make it uh, a little simpler, it's, uh, when you do that, it's opposite day. So you're loosening the barrel adjuster, but it's opposite day, so that tightens the brakes. Okay, uh, shifting. So, we do get questions about shifting, and um, you know, I'm probably dating myself by saying that I often will explain it by talking about manual transmissions in cars, but the idea is if you're going up a big hill and you find yourself unable to turn the pedals, they're just, it's just too slow, and you have to like try to get off the seat, then that's something where gears help you. So it's basically, um, it's, it's like having a lever to pop open a, a paint can or something like that. By, you, by having um, smaller uh, gears in the rear, uh, go from smaller to larger, what ends up happening is for every rotation of the pedal, uh, you get fewer turns of the rear wheel. So let me just kind of demonstrate that real quick. So, okay. So right now, if you look at the reflector, one full rotation of the wheel, that's one rotation, 
it's about two rotations, almost, almost two full rotations of the wheel for every one rotation of the pedal. But on what we would consider a lower gear, okay, so getting back to where, okay. So one rotation of the pedal, one full rotation got you actually only less than three quarters of one rotation. So what this effectively does is um, you t to go the same distance, you now have to turn the pedals much more, but that allows, basically gives you this leverage advantage. On the other hand, if you're going down a big hill and you feel like your legs are spinning out, you just can't keep up, you have to pedal too fast, then that's where you want to shift to a higher gear. And um, the, uh, the key to this, uh, without getting too complicated is, generally speaking, they often have numbers. So the lower the number, the better it is for going up a hill. The higher the number, the better it is for going down a hill, for going fast. Cross-chaining. Cross-chaining. Uh, cross so cross-chaining, real quick, is if you use like the big uh, cog and the big chain ring. And the reason why this is bad is it puts a lot of stress on the, um, on the chain, because it's, it's trying to twist the chain sideways. But you know this has three, co three chain rings up front and seven um, cogs in the rear. So it's got 21 gears, but the thing is, they're not 21 unique gears. The ranges of them, if you think of the, the, the numerical ranges, they, they overlap to some extent. And so what ends up happening is, if you cross chain by using the big in the front and the big in the rear, there's actually another combination by moving this one to the middle one and moving this down a couple gears that is the same ratio. So you don't need that ratio, but by putting it in this ratio, you're putting more stress on the chain than, than um, I do you want. that all the time. <laughs> it's, it, it's one of these things where, um, so there, there's some super expensive uh, um, bike thing in Europe where you fly over there, you get to ride their $5,000 bikes, whatever. And apparently, uh, I was reading somewhere that they, uh, in their pamphlet, they basically tell you, if we see you cross-chaining, we're going to tell you not to. And if you keep doing it, we're going to charge you money. Because on very expensive bikes, like I said, it can start to wear things and damage them. Um, but for the average person, it's, it's less of an issue. It just it doesn't shift that well. Yeah, well, like and, Right, right. Now, the one, thing to, one thing to note, though, is in shifting, so you should shift early because the, these, the chain doesn't like to jump from cog to cog when it's under a lot of torque. So if you start going up that hill, you want to try to shift early. If you're at the point where you're, trying, you're up on the, off the saddle and you're, you're standing up and you're just like cranking on it, you can still shift the rear. It's not going to like it. It's going to make all sorts of noise. but if you try to shift the front, it will absolutely drop it. You'll drop the chain. The reason for that is the tension on the chain is between this point on the cog and this point on the chain ring. This is also the point where the chain's being moved in the front, and that's why you're trying to move it, but you're trying to put tension on it. And so that doesn't work. In the rear, it actually changes it down here where there's, less, there's actually very little tension on the chain because the chain picks up all the tension at the top. So you can still change a rear derail your, uh, change your gears in the rear when you're pedaling hard. It doesn't like it, but it will do it. But if you try to do that in the front, you're almost guaranteed to drop the chain. So it sounds like I need to find out what the best time to use the small, medium, and large chain or whatever. Right, what I usually do, um, I leave mine, so mine, mine has three chain rings in the front. I'll leave mine in the middle if I'm going down a big hill, I'll go to the big one. If I'm going up a big hill, I'll switch it to the little one. But the rest of the time, I just leave it in the middle. But again, uh, in fact, I dropped, <laughs> I dropped the chain coming up the hill with the trailer because I kind of forgot about that. And I was focusing on the fact that I had the trailer. And all of a sudden, I was like, OK, I need, I need to change. And I forgot, switched it, and dropped the chain. So 
I mean, it, happened, it happens to everyone. Uh, so, uh, here we go. Uh, no, we, I mean, we're trying to, trying to, trying to keep it simple. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, next item on our bicycle basics is what we call a pre-ride check. And this is kind of a, you know, what do, what should you do each time before you ride? In particular, though, if you haven't ridden it for a month or two, you definitely want to kind of take a look at these. Uh, if you just rode it yesterday, you probably don't have to be that careful. The pre-ride check, we say A, B, C, Q. A is air. And so when, you know, you can, you can be very picky and get an air gauge, digital air gauge or something like that. But generally speaking, what you want to see is that when you put your weight on the seat, the tire doesn't squish. So this one you can see when I push on it, that deflects maybe only 10%. You know, same thing here. You know, this one just a little bit more maybe. But if you, if you put your weight on your bike and you push with your full weight down and you see that the tires are going from this to that, that's like 50%. That's almost certainly more than you want. And the problem that happens is You've probably seen uh, where the valve stems are bent leaning over. You've seen bikes where uh, this stem is actually like at a 45 degree angle. That's because if the tire pressure is too low, the tube starts to move and you can actually cut the valve stem here and that will actually give you a flat. If this valve stem is leaned over, at, instead of being straight up in the, in the hole, if it's leaned over by 45 degrees, the metal is, it will start to cut the, uh, the rubber around the, the base. So, so that's, that's the first thing. Uh, second thing is on the brakes. And again, uh, there's ways we talked about how to, to adjust it, but you want to make sure that you're comfortable with your brakes stopping you in a reasonable distance. If you're riding down Whitmore Lake Road at 40, 35, 40 miles an hour, you're going to want those brakes to be working really well. If you're only going to the store and you're never going much past walking speed, you know, you'll have to judge what you think is safe. Um, then the uh, C is chain, and the chain shouldn't be rusty. If it is rusty, uh, they can often be resurrected. If it's rusty and it's like really stiff, that may be an issue and, and that'll probably take more work. But um, every month or every you know, 10 rides or something like that, you'll want to, to make sure that it's lubricated. People will often ask, well, can I use like WD-40 or, or, or household oil? Uh, the answer is WD-40 can work in an emergency, but the problem is the oil that's in WD-40 is very light and literally evaporates within days. So if you put WD-40 on your bike chain, you'll have to put it back on almost daily for it to work, to, to protect the chain. Uh, something like a three-in-one oil, it's not bad. There are obviously um, oils that, uh, that they sell uh, for, uh, for bike, uh, for cleaning the bike, for, for lubing the bike chain. Um, Generally speaking, uh, depending on what kind of conditions, I'm sure you've seen bikes where it looks like there's, there's wax. There's black wax, and that's basically a combination of the oil and dirt that builds up. And that's never good because the dirt will wear things. So you do want to clean them with a small screwdriver, toothpick, old toothbrush. Try to, try to get any of that buildup, that solid buildup that gets on the chain. And... Um, you know, get, a, get some fresh lube in there. Um, and then Q is for quick releases. You always want to be careful that uh, things are locked down. If for some reason you pick up the bike or you move the bike and, and you hear some rattling, it might be that your front fork um, isn't, your front wheel isn't properly locked. The newer bikes will have a little feature that prevents it from coming off entirely, but if it's loose, that isn't going to work properly for braking, et cetera. So you want to double check the quick releases. 
And then um, the last thing is to, uh, a couple times a year, you just want to check the spoke tension. Uh, we, sometimes we see bikes come in and uh, the spokes are, are you, can, you can just tell that they're loose. I mean, there should be, there should be enough tension. You can, you can hear this ringing, almost like a guitar string or something. They should, they should definitely have tension. The um, thing about spokes is when you get a couple spokes that are really loose, the rest of them start to get loose. Okay. And then we have a, a, a few instructions on the proper way to uh, lube your chain. And there's a couple different types of uh, chain lube depending on if you're riding in wet conditions. If you're a commuter, you'll probably want the wet chain lube if you're doing Mountain biking on dirt roads, you probably want more of the dry lube. When you tighten your spokes, does it change the trueness of your wheel? Yes. You, if you're tightening spokes, you have to be careful not to, to affect that. You don't necessarily need a truing stand to do that. You can actually do that just by looking at your brakes. But if it's just a couple spokes, probably not a big deal. If you have a lot of loose spokes, then you probably do need to take it to some place that has a truing stand because if you, because if you start to do too many spokes, then not only will it be less true, and the trueness is sort of this, the in and out where it's rubbing on the brakes, but you can also get the roundness. You can, if, if you uh, change too many of the spokes, it'll literally be out of round. You could easily, if I was to play around with these spokes enough, I could easily make this into an oval, but you know, that's, that wouldn't be good for riding. Okay. Uh, next one is fixing a flat, and um, we'll be doing the hands-on, of course, uh, after this session, this part of the uh, presentation. And uh, so I'll just kind of go over this really quickly. But uh, the first thing, of course, is you have to remove the wheel. In this case, we've got a quick release. Um, this is a quick release, too, but often you will have bolts. This one, as you can see, it has bolts, but it also has these tabs. And this is, again, this is to prevent, this is to make sure that even if for some reason you didn't tighten this properly, that the wheel doesn't come off entirely. So the wheel will more or less stay where it needs to be if, even if the bolt is a little bit loose. But once you take the wheel off the bicycle, then you have to remove the tire. And then you, you should check the inside of the tire for thorns. If you ran over a piece of glass or you ran over a thorn, if you ran over a nail and it's still sticking in your tire, it's obvious what gave you the flat tire and you probably will pull the, uh, the nail out. But if you have a thorn or a piece of glass, if you fix the flat and you don't get rid of that thorn or that piece of glass, you'll go another mile and you have another flat. So. Uh, Best thing to do, no gloves, gently uh, you know, run your hand throughout the inside, make sure that there isn't something sharp that's left over. Then you patch the tube, and we'll talk about that again in the, uh, the hands-on. Then to put the, uh, the tire and tube back on, you put a little bit of air into the tube, and then using uh, tire levers, uh, which you probably will need to, to take the tire off to begin with, uh, you, you carefully put the tire back on, and, and again, we'll do all that um, in the hands-on. Okay. And then, uh, last but not least, put it back on the bike. Uh, one thing to be aware of is um, where the wheel mounts in the bike. These are called dropouts. It is pretty easy to actually put the tire, the, put the wheel back on the bike and not, have, not having it sit properly in the dropouts. And so you'll notice things like the brakes are suddenly rubbing or it's not shifting right. And so we, we always recommend is put the wheel in the bike, but then put the wheel uh, and put everything on the ground because if you're putting weight on the bike, the wheel will, will force itself properly into the dropout and then be, before you fully tighten the wheel. Okay. Um, and then actually um, one thing that we've got noted in here is when you're inflating the tire back to the full pressure, 
be careful because if you didn't mount the tire back on properly, if the bead is somehow hung up or if the tube is, is folded under slightly, you'll suddenly notice that something starts poking out and that's basically the inner tube. And if you keep pumping up the tire, that will pop and now uh, that tube is, is completely ruined, so. Okay. All right. Uh, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, chain lube. Um, and I, I covered this a little bit in the, uh, in the ABC quick check. Um, so talking about uh, different kinds of uh, lubes, the important thing to understand is that the chains are actually pretty complicated. If you look at the little diagram, and if you look at number seven, that's this little donut that is what they call a roller. And so a bicycle chain, these are actually called roller chains, and that little number seven is a roller. And so that donut spins around the uh, little pins in number two. So when you, see, when you see rust on a chain, usually it's not a problem. It's often cosmetic, but if the chain is stiff, that often means that you've got corrosion between you know, these, these other parts. And so that's where, um, you know, if you put on something like a, w, like a WD-40, you can usually work them loose, um, or you can buy a new chain. Uh, chains, chains don't tend to be terribly expensive, depending on the type. But the key is that the lube does two things. It obviously reduces friction, but it also helps prevent dirt and, and other things from getting inside the, uh, the, the links. So uh, the process for, uh, for lubricating it would be to clean off any caked dirt or old lubrication with, like I said, toothbrush, anything else. Then. Um, Usually, uh, even if you don't have a bike stand, you just have it standing up, you can just pedal it backwards and with, with your, um, your oil can or whatever you have, drip oil so that it's on all the links. Uh, go for a quick ride, let it kind of work its way in, but then wipe off any excess. And the reason for wiping off any excess chain lube is it usually makes a mess if you don't, if, if, if it, it's all over the place, but it's also sticky. It also can be sticky, so uh, if it picks up dirt, that will uh, build up eventually to this, this black crayon stuff that builds up all over the wheels, so. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so this was, and we talked about brakes, and so in the upper right, uh, there's different kinds of brakes. We aren't really talking about disc brakes today, although um, in the breakout session, if you have questions on disc brakes, I can, I can probably cover some of that. But um, the, the key thing is that the brakes should contact the rim evenly if you view it in the upper right-hand corner. So they should always make full contact with the rim. Um, so if you're looking straight down the wheel, you want it to come in and make contact with the rim. You don't want it angled if you look along the rim, and you don't want it where it's only contacting part of it. However, if you're looking downwards at the pad, um, you can see at the picture below here on the right, there's something called toe-in. Toe-in really helps with squealing. So if you have an issue with squealing brakes, that'll, that'll fix it. And then the other thing, of course, is brakes have uh, wear indicators. If you look at the one on the lower left, you can see where the grooves are. Once those grooves go away, uh, you need a new brake pad. But rims will also wear out. The one here is, you can see in the middle, that's quite worn, because usually that should be flat. The newer bike rims will actually have a wear indicator, which is either a groove or a little dimple. And when that dimple or that groove is worn away, then the rim should be replaced. But uh, otherwise, just look to see how worn it is, whether it's still flat. Okay. Um, 
And the last thing, when you're adjusting brakes, with, uh, with this type of brake, you know, this is a standard mountain bike. This is what they call a cantilever. V brakes are the same thing. Um, the side to side, sometimes you get rubbing on one side but not the other. So there's little screws here that will allow you to recenter it relative to the wheel. With uh, the older style brakes, um, you actually have to loosen the actual brake, the whole brake mechanism. Uh, just a sec here. We actually have a, a sample, but um, okay. Well, the uh, we'll do that in the hands-on. You can you can see how that that's done. But uh, one thing that does happen though is sometimes if the wheel is out of true, so which is to say it goes side to side, um, it'll rub on the brakes when it rub when it goes to side, and then you have to do some trolling. And um, we're not covering that today, but that basically uh, has to do with tightening the spokes to, to move the wheel one way or the other. Okay. Okay. So that is, from a technical standpoint, that's, those are the items we wanted to cover today. Uh, I do want to say that um, we do have five, Common Cycle has five sets of tools located here um, at the downtown library. Uh, they're available for one week loans and you can see the parts that are involved. Uh, the tools basically allow you to do quite a bit more than we talked about here today. Um, there's everything, for example, things like lock rings so, uh, and uh, spoke wrenches that'll allow you to do truing. The website, we do have a number of videos that walk you through uh, how to use some of the tools. So if you do have um, needs to do significant repairs, uh, this is a bit more involved than what we've talked about today. And uh, Park Tool at YouTube also has a lot more repair videos for, um, for, for bicycle repair. Okay. And... Um, so we're right at about an hour. So we did get through this a little bit faster than usual than we were expecting. Um, the next part is the hands-on. So we're gonna have three different stations set up. The three stations are one where we'll show you how to fix a flat, how to remove a tire, and to put it back on uh, a wheel. Another station will be brake pad adjustments. Uh, again, this is not disc brakes, but you know your typical rim brakes. And then the third station, we'll be talking about bike fit, the pre-ride check, oiling the chain, et cetera, as well as changing gears. And uh, we'll give a quick warning uh, before the 30 minutes are up so every, we can rotate and move to the next station. Um, and with that, uh, you should also check out our, uh, our website and our community workspace. We're at 416 West Huron, Suite 11, which is just a few blocks from here. Our public hours are Sunday from 11 to 3, and Tuesdays 6 to 8, which is uh, a new uh, hour for a new slot for us. It's, it's going to be seasonal uh, at this time, uh, but the best thing to do, of course, is to check our website for uh, not only our public hours, but our class offerings and other resources that we might have.